today what we'll do here is so let me start this way see when i was studying i was not at all very interested in academics well the so called engineering academics and the way it happened is mujhe physics mein bahut interest tha i was lot more interested in physics doing stuff but when you get selected in je and you know you have to so then there is a protocol that most people follow typically because of social pressure parental pressure what not and what not so because of that you know you ended up choosing something and then i realized especially if you are born and brought up in up you know or probably bihar and mp as well if you are reasonably good in studies you will be tell bhaiya ias karo you know you should do ias because that is sort of so and i for some reason i thought that i'll be able uh, i really wanted to contribute something to society so thought ias is a good way so mujhe isme karna nahi so for first two years i had not very much interest in academics third year i mean i started thinking okay maybe it's i mean there are few things which i do enjoy essentially because i enjoyed physics and so i went with this uh, sort of you know project with one of my department professor professor devang khakkar and he introduced me to this wonderful word of particles and grains or what we typically call as particulate solids so what i'm going to talk about here is you know so i owe whatever i have interest passion little bit knowledge of this essentially i owe to him <coughs> and so the topic of this talk is enjoying physics with particles and grains all right so what i'm going to talk about talk about is collection of particles which is a more commonly referred as granular materials so granular is anything which is composed of grains so lots and lots and lots of grains particles you know and essentially what you get is a large collection of particles the particles have to be characterized in some way so we are saying that let them be discrete individual particles right so it's a large collection of discrete macroscopic and solid particles right so solid is obvious because there's no point talking about at least in this scenario talking about fluid particles and all right so it has to be solid particles and what do we mean by macroscopic so too many voices nothing clear maybe one fellow in loud voice what is what is macroscopic are batao yaar sahi bata rahe the khali tez batana hai sab log bol rahe ho to kuch samajh nahi aa raha hai one fellow give me what do we say when we say something is macroscopic what do you mean okay that's one possible way ma when we say something is macroscopic what is the most common rudimentary form you understand that's reasonable so for example if i say something is millimeter scale will you call it microscopic or macroscopic macroscopic right but if i let's say if i am on a scale of microns will you call it macroscopic or microscopic <laughs> microscopic right so it's very obvious right basically because you cannot see it with a naked eye you need something additional you need a tool you need a something like maybe if i maybe some some sort of a microscope right some sort of lens to so if you can look at objects which are which you can visible which are visible to our naked eye then you call them macroscopic solid objects right so the typical limit that you typically sort of you know particle size of course so it depends on where are you placing the particle i place 1 kilo so statue of liberty is long lot bigger than 1 micron or 1 mm but it's far off right so in technicality it's going to be function of your lighting conditions how far your things which you are looking at and where are you on all right but for the common sense common uses if you have something which is sort of you know maybe in an arms distance or if you can basically put it bring it close to you and then if you can see it then you that's what you call macroscopic which is typically 100 microns is what you will typically 100 microns to 10 microns maybe 10 microns probably too less but I mean if i have something in the order of 100 microns i can say sub millimeter scale essentially right 0.1 millimeter is what you can easily see right of course when i am talking about i'm saying assuming that you have a sort of spherical particle you can say that i can see a hair which is fairly thin so and so the example of these collections are some of them i'll probably show you here well these are not transparent so you'll probably not see it uh, can i connect well we'll we'll do that maybe a bit later so essentially you have a examples include sand with which we'll do lot of experiments stones which you can very commonly observe anywhere ball bearings cereals something like this essentially right so is anything which is basically made of particles right individual solid particles here it is moong dal i don't know what it what is moong called in english and peanuts okay so basically just anything which is a collection of solid particles 
So let's look at a historical quote from René Descartes. In his Principles of Philosophy, long before he wrote, I remember, you know, don't, this is around 1650s, 1644 to 47 to be more precise. He wrote, a body is liquid when it is divided into several smaller parts that move separately. All right? And it is solid when all its parts are in contact, right? So all its parts are in contact when you're moving them. All the parts are, parts are in contact and moving. Liquid is made of several smaller particles and they, move, they may move separately, right? Probably when he wrote this, granular materials were not in his mind because these are particles that move separately, right? They are moving separately, right? But they're also in contact, right? Do you see any particle in here has, is not in contact with any other particle when it's moving? So essentially the message is that the traditional way we historical way you typically look used to look at solids, liquids and gas. In that sense, these material don't classify into one regime because individually one particle is of course, no doubt it's a solid particle. But when you have a collection of them, they may behave like solid, like this container. These guys are not doing anything. Yeah? They're sitting there idle like a solid, right? But if you start rotating them, let's say if I roll this, then they're flowing, right? Your particles, if you can look. So now they're flowing like liquid. In fact, if I can, let's say if I take very few particles in a box and I keep juggling them, then each of these particles are actually, so essentially your density is too low and you're energizing them very heavily. Your each in individual particle is going to be in a ballistic motion, right? So if your density is less, so and you're giving enough energy to the system, they may also behave like a gas. And so essentially, these materials can behave like solid, like most of the gravel piles or anything that you see in there, right? When they are not energized, there's no energy input to the system, they're behaving like, like, okay, so one more thing. Satyana Bhagwan ki katha nahi chal rahi hai, ki ante mein sab logo ne Bhagwan ji ki jai bulke jana hai. You guys have to say something, then I'll proceed, okay? So you guys have to keep engaged, I don't want to, I mean, I'm not a transmitter which will keep transmitting and you guys keep receiving, you know, that, that only works in mobile towers. All right? So if you do not energize the system, it's going to behave as solid, right? There's no confusion about that, right? In fact, most of the theory, for example, if you look at soil mechanics, soil again is composed of very fine, fine to coarse collection of grains, right? And then of course it has some moisture and humidity and some moisture content, so it behaves. But the way these are modeled are essentially, you know, theory of plasticity, solid mechanics, and those ideas are very much relevant there. The other extreme, the so-called gaseous regime, right? When you have just very few particles, your, the input to the energy to the system is just too high. The system cannot dissipate energy so quickly. There the system behaves like a gas. And in fact, one of the, uh, so early 80s people started looking at this approach that if you have collection of grains, right? So if I have collection of grains and they're just bouncing in a highly energized flow, what is happening is most of the time your particle is going into a ballistic motion and then maybe hits either a pop particle, another particle or a boundary, all right? And so you can think in terms of the mean free path the particle takes and all those ideas. In fact, the ideas of kinetic theory of gases are very much relevant there. People have extended the kinetic theory of gases to these systems, okay? Now what is the difference? The difference is when you have two molecules Let's say you hypothetically assume that there are two molecules which are going to hit each other. They don't lose any energy when they collide, right? They don't lose the, the energy. You're not basically the energy is the kinetic energy is being plus potential energy. You know, so kinetic energy goes down, potential energy increases, and then eventually you are separating the particles, potentially converts back to kinetic energy, right? When you have solid particles, let's say if you have two solid particles two balls, let's say plastic balls or iron balls, if they come and hit, hit, hit each other, first of all, the so-called long range potential forces, not there, right? So you don't feel anything coming unless 
you are hit by something, right? And once, as soon as you hit, as soon as you hit the other ball, then you are feel a force. The contact is for a very brief period of time, right? And then you bounce back. But in this process, you lose some energy, right? So this happens. So if I drop a ball, it basically hits the surface, comes back, and eventually keeps losing the energy, and becomes static, right? But but let's say if I have a surface which basically keeps hitting it with a this thing, right? So if you keep providing the energy input, then this can maintain this bouncing state eternal, right? For one ball. If you have many such balls, you can maintain this balls in a gaseous kind of environment, right? That's what the overall system behaves like. And so many people actually, a lot of development has been happening on that, that you start with the kinetic theory of gases. The difference being that now you have to account for the dissipation that is because of the collision with particles or with boundaries. So you account for those things. You get the particle uh, velocity distributions and all that. You know, and then you use the Maxwell Boltzmann equation to get sort of you know, the kinetic theory of granular gases. And it turns out that pressure indeed in this case is proportional to temperature with some complex factors, which is uh, complex pre-factors, which are function of density, just like in you have right pressure is function of density and temperature. So those details, in fact, that is one of the sort of you know most formal methods of dealing with particulate solids. In between the two regimes, where you are neither like solid, neither like liquid, you typically have something like a liquid. So which is what we are seeing here, right? So if you look at this, if you can look at this, your rest of the just near the free surface, you have some flow occurring, and rest of the thing is rotating as if it's a solid block, isn't it? Can everyone see it or? So essentially, if you look at, if I'm rotating this, you'll see that the rest of the bar particles away from the free surface are just going under near rigid body rotation, right? It, there's nothing absolutely, well, from the visible eye, you don't see anything happening, right? Other than free surface, everything is just rotating as if it's a rigid body, right? So the particles do a rotation, they come to the free surface and then they flow like a liquid. So this is this simple system where you have not done any complicated stuff shows you that you have liquid and solid both present together. And in fact, if you, for example, let's say if you're pouring it from some place, so let's say if I'm pouring something and we'll probably do that experiment in some time. So you'll have a, just near the free surface, you can also have some ballistic motion, the particles hitting over each other, and you can get this gaseous regime as well. So all these three regimes can occur simultaneously. You know? So as if one was not, I mean, having three different behaviors was not good enough, you can have all these three behaviors shown in one time. And that makes even more complicated to understand and model. So just, just a bit, little bit of motivation, probably not needed here because you guys are scientists, but for engineers, you know, everything has come in. So what is the physic, uh, physical relevance? Why, do, why are we interested in this? So according to estimates, processing of these particulate solids or granular materials, aggregates, they consume around 10% of all the energy that you typically sort of you know, manipulate in this world, which is a huge amount. This is a huge amount, all right? And especially in this current times when you are fo the focus on the energy conservation is a lot, basically you cannot ignore this great chunk of energy which is just spent into processing these things, right? And why is it so? Because these metals are highly dissipative. I did something and they come to exact stop in a second, right? Had it been water, you would see something happening, right? The ripples will continue, something will happen, right? You can think of something. You do something and they lose energy almost instantaneously, almost instantaneously. And in fact, on the scale of priorities of human activity, it is claimed that they rank second just after water, obviously, jal hi jeevan hai. They rank second on the scale of human priorities. Some examples are, for example, you, know, you have extraction of ores, sands, gravels, right? Crushing, grinding, you, you basically, you get an ore, you have to crush it so that you can get something out of it, right? And despite of all this, not much effort is put into understanding this basic thing. In fact, in industry, most of the practices that you have are still sort of, you know, if I'm not uh, probably factually correct, unless some industries have recently changed, most of the practices that you follow are still, you know, order of century old. 
that doesn't mean just because it is old you should discard it but the point is you know there have not been much improvement in terms of that people can use it in industry right so there is some so understanding in terms of basic sciences has been improving in fact past two three decades it has been tremendously active field where people from all branches you know mechanical engineering chemical engineering physics material science you name it you know every branch uh, they're just sort of you know trying to understand because this is such a fascinating thing looks very simple right if i have if i give you one plastic ball or one iron bead say that okay you drop this ball what happens with this ball you know you'll this problem has been killed in high school right you drop the ball kitni height pe jayegi at what height you know what is the velocity one ball what happens everybody knows right reasonably good unless you go to sort of you know really detailed contact mechanics but we uh, we are fine if you don't go but as soon as you can come to collection of particles then things don't really remain so easy and so because these materials are typically in form of raw material purchasing the raw material is what is primarily most of the cost is and around 75 to 80% of the total cost is typically the cost of the material processing and rest of the thing is relatively smaller portion of the total cost you know obviously if you're in industry you say that i'm going to reduce this by a the 20% cost let's say if i say rest of 20% is going into processing you say that i'll improve this by some amount people are not very keen long back but now probably they are because the margins are being cut so you don't have so you have to sort of save wherever you can and so now there is a lot of you know motivation and interest to understand what is happening here okay so at this time there's probably time that we stop here and do some very simple stuff let me see if i have any simple slide that i want to okay so industrial applications there are a lot of industrial applications we don't have to you know think too much construction industry agriculture and food industry everything virtually that you have is and here are some examples right so whatever you have pharmaceuticals one of the very major industrial partner which basically deals with this so in pharma for example what they do is you know you'll be typically taking various components of the powders and mixing them right and that is that poses a significant challenge i'll just so that with one of the examples that we'll look at cement industry ceramics industry mining and minerals industry blah 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 all right so this is the sort of you know motivation and all that now let's go to when i say i need collection of particles we said that it should be macroscopic right but you can actually go a bit more mathematical and figure out what do we mean by the size limit of grains so for example now that i have one particle so let's say the idea is that my grain should be big enough so that the thermal fluctuations become negligible what do you mean by thermal fluctuations temperature right so on a molecular scale let's say if you if you imagine you should take maybe if if possible let's take one molecule out of air in this room assume the room temperature is around 27 so that basically it temperature becomes 300 kelvin so your t is around 300 kelvin now if you look at that one molecule right with what velocity do you think this molecule is moving around is there a way we can think of what is the do i make sense so you have so what is temperature temperature is a measure of heat and fundamentally what is what is temperature <laughs> kinetic energy right kinetic energy of the molecules right so if there is if the temperature is higher that means the molecules possess higher kinetic energy so if i want to relate the kinetic energy of the molecule let's say with temperature what i mean can i relate that so be, let's say if i take one molecule if i take one molecule will have half mass of the molecule into v square is equal to boltzmann constant into into temperature or temperature square temperature square or temperature kt right so half mv square equal to kt that is the typical so and this v that we are saying is essentially is a v rms right so you don't have a mean flow as such right there is no net flow occurring in this system right but individual molecules are essentially fluctuating and colliding and sort of you know bombarding all across and this average v root mean square velocity speed is what you are calling as right so if you just do a hand waving calculation your half mv square is of the order of 
kb into t temperature is order 100 300 kelvin boltzmann constant is 10 to the power minus 23 everybody is fine with that all right kb is order 10 to the power minus 23 multiply so well, I am not going to use the board. This is something that we should be able to do without using board. Right? Just order of magnitude analysis. So, KV into T will be order 10 to the power minus 21, right? Now, what is the mass of, let us say, one molecule? For simplicity, let us assume that, I mean, you can get exact number, but let us say it is approximately all nitrogen, right? So, nitrogen, can we know the mass of molecule of, mass of one more molecule, one molecule of nitrogen? किसी को याद है कैसे करेंगे कोई इफ समबडी रिमेम्बर्स द नंबर गिव अस द नंबर अदरवाइज टेल अस हाउ डू यू प्रोसीड शो प्लीज Alright, does it make sense? I mean, otherwise you just assume that. Remember Avogadro number? One mole of nitrogen is having 10, 6.023, 10 is for 23 molecules, right? So if you, and so the how many do you have? You have 28 grams of nitrogen, right? Have this many. So this is order of 10 to the power minus 4 into 10 to the power minus 23 kind of number, right? 26, sorry, yeah. So if you, that is gram, right? So if you convert to, so then you have got, so mass is of 10 to the power minus 26. So your V square will be ordered 10 to the power 26 by 26 minus 21, right? 10 to the power 5. And we have other factors, you know, if you take care of that, they typically are ordered 10. So basically your V RMS square is ordered 10 to the power 4. V RMS is ordered. 10 is power 2, right? 100 meter per second. So one individual molecule in this room, though you don't feel it, is essentially zigzagging around 100 meter per second. No human can move with that speed. I don't know if we have even vehicles like ground vehicles running on ground who can move with that speed, right? But you don't feel it, right? So why why can so what is the? I mean, so essentially if because of so the whole idea of having this size limit coming to this is that if you have a molecule which is very whose mass is very small. Right? So this is then your collisions from the surrounding molecules, they'll essentially move this, right? So for example, if you go into the liquid, then you have colloidal regime where this Brownian forces, right? The collision they become important. We want to operate in a regime where all those things are not there. So you want to have a limit. So let's look at a glass bead at room temperature. Density is sort of given 2500 kg per meter cube. Diameter for simplicity, let's assume one millimeter green which is like really small temperature 300 kelvin thermal energy is of the 10 to the power minus 27 as we calculate now the so you can you have to relate it with kinetic energy of the particle so then you have to you have to get in some sense what is the v that's the other possibility is that you can relate it with the potential energy of the particle so what is the change in the potential energy of the particle if it moves moves by one particle diameter that could be another comparable number because your velocity is essentially in this case typically comes because of moment in gravity. So there's a relation between kinetic energy and potential energy. So if you calculate the kinetic potential energy of one bead when it drops by one particle diameter, this energy is of the 10 to the power minus 10 joule compared to 10 to the power minus 21 joule. All right, so that means the temperature is basically more than 10 orders of magnitude. Energy because the thermal fluctuation is 10 to the power 10 orders of magnitude is smaller. So you don't really bother, right? In fact, you can just use this, say that this MGD, at what temperature do the, at what size of the particle, the KBT becomes equivalent to MGD, and M is d raised to power, uh, d proportional to d cube, so you'll get a number approximately order one micron. So beyond one micron size, this becomes important. So you don't want to go below that size, you want to stay away from that size. 
And then we go further one, we increase the size maybe a couple of more orders of magnitude, just to make sure that the Van der Waals effect, drag, humidity, drag because of air presence and all, they all can be neglected. So what we are going to talk about is essentially for typical grain sizes greater than 100 microns, that is what we'll probably demonstrate here. And in this range, basically all other forces become irrelevant. And the only thing that is important is contact forces, right? So then I can reduce this problem to my high school physics problem, right? A ball hits the surface or another ball and I can do my maths, physics, whatever I want without bothering about all this complicated stuff, right? That is what people, so when the idea to sort of you know, operate this line because hopefully you'll only have contact forces. So we are basically a uh, lot more in a easy to play with numbers and uh, effects of many other forces are not there. So let's look at this. And so now we have tried to simplify the system as much possible, right? Jitne sare complicated forces hain, sab humne hata diya. All that you say is the particle when it hits another particle or when it hits a surface only then it experiences a force, right? This is the simplest problem that we can think of. If you have one small particle, right? Now this simple system, when you come to collection of this becomes very messy and we'll start with some very simple examples. Let me see if I have anything else to go. Okay, so basically we are talking about regimes uh, greater than 100 microns. Yes, maybe one more thing we probably. So strictly speaking, these are two phase fluids, right? Because if you look at this, there is air present in the voids, right? This, let's say if these are not spherical particles, so these are more like spherical particles. So you have a spheres, you collect a stack of spheres, you'll have void space in between them, right? In the densest packing limit of monodispersed gain, you'll have roughly 64% of the solid volume, right? Rest of all is going to be occupied by air. So we typically have solid particles dispersed in air. And what you typically assume is the fluid could be either air or gas or even a liquid, right? So we have been ignoring air, assuming something. So similarly, there may be regimes where you can ignore the liquid as well. So we will not go into them. But essentially, we are operating in a regime where the interstitial fluid, interstitial fluid can be ignored. So the particle-particle contact stress is basically a lot more important than the viscous fluid stress, all right? And we have already sort of, so for example, if you have look at maybe a drop of one spherical bar falling in air, the air resistance will be a lot more significant. Your particle is of size one micron, right? But if you have maybe of millimeter size, then this becomes very little relevance. So essentially, your behavior is determined only by contact forces, right? And they can behave as solid or liquid or gas. And we'll start with one simple demo. And I need some help here. Can you come here, Om? So I've got this. <coughs> So, Jinke Pass Nia, one mobile Nikal, Jinke Pass Top Watch or Stop Watch Nikal. So, what we are going to do is so what we are going to do is let's stop, we'll start with this, we'll start with this. So, what we are going to do is See, we, I said when we was, I was just giving you this background, I said that when they are flowing, they behave like liquid, right? So we'll just do a demo of the liquid-like phase to show that yes, indeed they can flow like liquids, but they are not like liquid. So what we'll do here is, yeah. So the here is a container, and this probably too much full. Oops, is it? So what we're going to do here is maybe one of you can start your stopwatch. Aman, can you just come here? So you just, what he'll do is, huh. so as soon as we say start, we'll start our stopwatch. You will collect this, and when we say stop, you can just take this off and pour another thing, right? So what we're going to say is basically we're going to have a measurement of the flow rate of the sand that is coming out of this, all right? And let me also just have my stopwatch. Okay, so you, you let let it flow. So is karulta karo. No, not this way. The other way around. Open, leave that open. 
that has to be open. Okay, so you all can see that it flows like liquid, right? I don't think there is any. So it does flow like liquid, right? And I'm not going to do the experiment with water fill this thing, but you know if there was water, water will also flow like this. And your flow rate will be changing with the change in height, right? That you can easily. Let's see what happens here, okay? So I'll say, Anaman, can you start? So as soon as start. So let's see how long does it take to fill one of these. We are deliberately taking it for a longer time duration so that we have. So we will fill it all the way so that the time that we are measuring is actually large enough. So the errors that we get are really small. Okay, so, so maybe you can just make sure that huh, you just keep rotating so that, oops, sorry, don't drop so that this just basically remains on a surface and as soon as this is comes to this thing, you just stop, okay, stop. No, you don't have to, don't have to start this, okay, let, let it go. All right, so how much did you get? 50 point? Okay, so there are different readings, but let's just let it flow, no problem. So we have got 50 point. Okay, 50 point. 86. 90. Anyone 50 point 1, somebody got? What is the least number? 50 point? 7? Anybody less than 50.7? 50.6, don't hesitate. How I many of you got 50.6? Okay, so the minimum that we got is 50.6. And the maximum you have got is? 51. 51.4? I mean, we'll just stick to the first decimal maybe. 51.6? No, I'm, 4 is the highest, right? 51.4 is the highest? Okay, so this is the you know, time that we are measuring for the, so remember our experiment itself has reasonable, so I am deliberately letting it flow without collecting it, so the mass, the level has come down reasonably okay. We will do this again, okay. So can you start with, wait, let, let, let me say start and start. So this time we will stop at maybe the, as soon as we hit 51, we will stop and see if the two flow rates are very different. So I've got 40 seconds here and they're doing reasonably okay. So. Shall we stop? Stop. So we again filled it to the same sort of height. Numbers are? 58 point? Fifty-eight point. Rakh do thodi maybe you can probably help. Fifty-eight point nine. That is the least number that we got. Okay, this time that seems you got something different. Fifty-seven point eight. Okay. Fifty-seven point eight is the least number, and what is the maximum number we got? Fifty-eight point nine. Fifty-eight point nine. 59.0, 59.1, we'll stick to the first decimal, 59.1 is what we maximum number we got, 59.3, is that it, 59.31, 59.32, 59.33, alright, so you got some number here, we can continue doing this, 
But you see there is some difference that is coming, right? Let me now demonstrate a different experiment. No, don't do it. So, so you see some dependence here, right? What we'll do here is, so this was fine sand. All right, what we did here was fine sand. You, and let's not mix the two, so. So what we'll do now is, so this is a bit more coarse sand and we'll again do the same experiment. This time it should be quicker, hopefully because it should flow a bit faster. All right, so you start the flow, okay? And you, no, you let him start and then uh, you, you start collecting, okay? So we'll do start again, okay? I say start and you, st okay, start. All right, almost done, stop. All right, so stop, stop, or you can let it flow. How much did we get? All right. What is the minimum number? 14.35 se chota koi hai? 14.17. 14.17, 14 14.2, right? 14.2 is the least number that we got. Maximum is 15.7, ठीक है? So this is the this is the range of things we got. I'll also just put mine, so I got somewhere in between the average. So not bad. All right. So now we'll. Do this again. Wait, let me say start and then you. All right, ready, start. And you have to leave. You should have actually filled. Stop. Okay, let it flow. What numbers did we get this time? Minimum number 14.9. Kisi ka aaya kya? 14.8, 14.8 is the least number that we got. Maximum number we got is 16. Anybody higher than 16? Okay, I'll just put it 16.0. Just for the sake of comparison, I'll put mine as well because I was too close to the experiment so I could probably control it in a bit more detailed fashion. But this is what we got, right? Now, do you want to do one more? It's still flowing. Okay, sure. Come on. Maybe home. You can just come on, you can help him. Come on, you hold it. Let him do this. No, no, not this. We'll we'll tell. In fact, okay, let, let's leave it. Just ne haan katha usko padana chahiye tha. Theek hai? So we'll start again. Okay, I'll say start and then start. Stop. You guys, you filled it more than what it was. Probably a bit more. This number was so. In here, you, they basically ended up filling. A, no, no, don't, don't compress it. Then you. <laughs> All right. So you. So this time we filled a bit more, which was kind of. So the experiment was not that successful. But we'll still write down this number. What is the number we got? Point. Okay. Okay, you continue to champion. <laughs> okay, and who else? Seventeen point six. Largest number, seven point six. Seventeen point eight. All right. So this time we got a higher number. That's what it is, right? This data probably we should be a bit more careful. We can do one more if you want, but we'll probably continue because we are running short of time here. So if you look at here. Within the limit of error bars, if I take the mean, if I take the mean of the two values that we got, we are not very off, isn't it? 
I mean, if you take the mean and consider sort of, you know, let's say if you do the experiment and take the standard deviation, you are seeing that. So, for example, these two numbers, I mean, you can take the average and it will probably not be that far. Well, you will be a bit far, but you are sort of, this is the number I got because I was, you know, I said start the experiment, I controlled the, so I probably had a bit more control over collection of the time. And you find that this, the numbers are not too different here. Though we did observe a bit of, so for example, these are not within the limit of error bars, all right? If I, if I very loosely plot the limit of error bars, so if my data is this, these two are basically going, right? So there is no way I can say that they are on the, within the limit of error bars. But these guys, you know, you have 14.2 to 15.7 and you have 14.8 to 16.0, right? So these two data blocks, if I plot them on top of each other, you get on the, it's hard to distinguish between these two flow rates compared to these two, right? And so in this case, probably we can say that with the limited sort of controlled experiment that we had, and we are not <coughs> very careful in the last trading, it turns out that the flow rate is almost the same, right? Remember the difference between this sand, the mooring actually, and the other one is this was a bit coarse sand. This is a coarse sand compared to the fine one. So essentially you get a flow rate which is independent of height, right? Height was changing. So you get a flow rate which is independent of height in the case of coarse sand, right? Which is not the observation in case of fine sand. And the reason is because there the size is actually less than 0.3, uh, 0.3 millimeter. And it, it has substantial uh, sort of, you know, the sand here is basically has enough particles less than 100 microns. So your air drag does play a role, minor but important, but somewhat role. And so the, you don't get such a reproducible result here. But if you increase the size a bit, for example, in this case, you get much better result. For example, if I had, let's say, if I take steel balls, which are of millimeter size, I can re redo this experiment and I'll have a lot more better data substantiating my claim. So the idea is it does flow like liquid, nothing wrong with that, but somehow the pressure comes out to be, or the flow rate comes out to be independent of height. So it is a liquid, but unusual liquid, <coughs> all right? There are ways I think we'll probably not go in so there are simple ways to sort of think of that and maybe we'll just spend some time, some time on that. So one of the thing, one of the reasons of why this happens, and of course that is not correct, but helps in intuitively understanding what is happening. So let's say if you, there's this fellow called Janssen. In 1955, I think, no, sorry, not, I'm missing, uh, not 1955, it's probably even before, he basically did measure the pressure beneath a container, a corn filled container and he measured the pressure at the base, all right? So you know if you are filling liquid, the pressure keeps increasing with height. He tried measuring the same thing in a silo filled of corn and it turns out to be saturating. It does not really increase beyond a layer, beyond a height. So essentially if you have, so if you are measuring pressure here, your pressure and let us say if I have my height increasing this way, near the free surface, I mean let us say we are just looking at the pressure because the bed, not, so the difference from the actual pressure and atmospheric pressure, the pressure here is going to be 0, right? If it was a liquid column, we will expect something like this, right? pressure will be 0 at, sorry, my z should be, well it depends whichever way I want, but I mean let us just take this way, right? So pressure is 0 and then keeps increasing, all right? But if you measure the same in a silo filled of, let us say sand or what Johnson did, corn, it does not seem to follow this trend. It seems to saturate. So beyond the height, you basically do not see a change with, change in pressure with height. You essentially have a saturation. 
Can anybody guess now why is this, why this might be happening? This is a, so let's, I'm, I'm telling you that somebody did this experiment and found this. Can you now tell us why this might have, I mean, what could be causing this? And it's relatively easy to guess. Okay, this is the experiment. This is for the corn field, this thing. Can somebody guess me what might be happening here? So how do you get the pressure, linear variation of pressure in liquid column? What do we do? You do force balance, right? Very good. So now let's say if I had a column here, right? Let's say there is a cylindrical column, okay? The radius is capital R or whatever, D by 2. If I just look at the, this slice of, this slice of thickness dz, you'll have pressure at this end and this end. So if I just do a force balance, what forces do I get on this element of slice? We're talking about, let's say, the liquid column for the moment. What do we get here? First forces, weight, right? Are we getting something else as well? So if there's weight, they should simply keep accelerating, but it's not, so there should be some other force. So, but pressure sides. So let's say if this is P at Z, right? And I'm just drawing it deliberately. It's not giving a moment just to make sure that we are seeing it correctly. This will be P at, this is DZ, right? This will be Z plus DZ, right? And when you write a force balance, you essentially say that this PZ plus DZ has to be a bit greater than PZ so that you get this, right? So let's say, And so essentially your M is, let's just write this. So let's say if I'm writing, you'll have P at Z plus DZ minus P at Z, right? This becomes a net upward force, has to be equal to Mg and M is rho into pi R square DZ, right? This is my volume of the cylinder. So if I bring dz here, thanks, yes, so this will be area, right? So pressure into area, thanks. So then you have force and the right. So then this is what you get, your pi s square square gets cancelled, dz is now gone. What you have is? Right. And again, because we have chosen Z in the direction of, in the direction of gravity, this is what we get, right? Now, what is difference when this is not liquid but solid? Rho will change, that's fine. So you'll have a different gradient, that's fine. What else? Remember the solid-like property? Solid-like property. So when solids contact, when two solid surfaces contact, friction, right? Can we get somewhere friction in here? Is it possible that you can get some friction somewhere here? Can there be any frictional force somewhere? Two solid surfaces touching? Can there be some force somewhere? Will something be happening at this wall if I can give you a clue? Will you have, your material is coming down, right? Your solid, this layer, this material is coming down. So the material around the surrounding it is slowly moving down, right? And it is, so in there actually if you look at, so that's why it becomes a 
So if you look at, or maybe it's, I don't know how. So if, can you, one of you take this? So basically when this is flowing, close to the orifice, you have fluid-like flow. Rest of the thing is more or less static-like solid. Just take, take this along or maybe, you know, or maybe one of, one of you can probably, you know, just keep coming and seeing this. If you look at this from the top, just have a look at this. So you're just near the orifice, the flow is occurring. I wanted to use a document camera, but the surface is not so good. Right, it's, it's, it, is, it is an hourglass, right? So you don't have anything. So near the surf, solid surface boundary, this is very much like a solid type behavior. And so you get a friction force. And that friction force will be, because the layer is moving downwards, the friction will be acting. All right? And this friction force, essentially, is basically where it's acting on a surface normal is in the other direction, so we call it a shear stress. We are calling it as a shear stress. That shear stress is acting. So the force will be the shear stress into the, this area, right? So in that area will be 2 pi r. Right? So in the force balance, you get this additional term. So if I just, so you are writing the forces the net force, this was the force in the upward direction, right? So in addition, you will have tau into pi r dz, 2 pi r dz. Right? So my 2 pi r dz acting upwards, pz m plus dz is acting upward, pz and m this. So you have this additional term. And this tau, the shear stress we can relate with so this shear stress, we can just use Coulomb's law. So this, this force will be mu times the normal force. So this stress will be mu times the normal stress. So mu at the wall into normal force, right, or normal stress because we are dividing the area. So this will be, so this is normal stress acting on a, so this will be sigma RR, right. So on a plane which is normal to R in the direction R, so this will be sigma R R, right? And then this sigma R R, basically because you have solid like, so you can use solid like properties and it turns out that the sigma Z and sigma R R are related with, a, with each other. Some constant K, which is the anisotropic constant to sigma Z. So if you had fluid, then this number will be close to 1. It's exactly 1, right, because you don't have any difference. But in solids, you can have a bit of anisotropy. So this factor may be different than 1. <coughs> so then this essentially becomes mu w k sigma z. So now if I put it here, remember sigma z is what I'm calling pressure here, right? What you called here sigma pressure, or maybe I can just use it here itself, right? I'll just call it pressure. So then you have this additional term coming in here and this equation essentially becomes minus 4 tau, I am just skipping over some stuff here, over the diameter, alright. And this tau if you put in terms of P, so then this is an equation in terms of P which Essentially, the solution is, let me just push it off. We don't have white chalk here. Oh, the pieces are too small. Okay, I'll just continue with this. So what you'll have is dp over dz is equal to rho g minus, that's okay, they are too tiny angle, 4 by d. And tau we have written as mu w kappa p, all right? So just for simplicity, this is, so I'll assume this, I'll just write it in this form, where lambda is diameter divided by 4 mu w. Alright, 
So now because now that you have this equation, you can actually put it this way. And now if can you solve this equation? Is this equation solvable? You can bring P this side, you will integrate, you will get a ln of this thing, right? And because of this side friction that you have here, so let's just, okay, I'm sorry for using different color chalks because each chalk is just P is equal to d0 over lambda, right? Just integrate it from z going to 0 to any height or any depth z and pressure increasing from 0 because I am not taking care of the atmospheric pressure to p what I have is ln of right divided by lambda right so this some mistake that i'm doing here maybe ha huh. sorry so it has to be a minus sign here right because it's minus p so i should have a minus sign i'll just bring it here so essentially what this gives me is i have 1 minus pressure over rho g lambda exponential of minus z over lambda, right? And so my pressure essentially becomes, I can probably erase all this now. My pressure essentially becomes rho g lambda 1 minus So this is my pressure at any height, at any depth z. And this is what gives rise to your saturation velocity, uh, saturation pressure. So for z much, much later than, less than lambda, remember lambda has a dimension of, was diameter divided by some factors. So lambda has a length unit. So if z is much, much less than lambda, e to the power minus z lambda can be written as 1 minus z over lambda, 1 cancels off, lambda cancels the lambda, you essentially have pressure going as, back to what you get in, right? So you do see a similar behavior for small heights, but then for z much, much greater than lambda, this term essentially goes to, what happens if your z is much, much greater than lambda? e raised to power minus a large number becomes 0, pressure becomes a saturated number. That is what we observe in there, all right? So, Though this seemingly supposedly should explain why the pressure was, because the pressure is saturating, it is most natural for us to think, because the pressure is saturated, you don't see a dependence on flow rate, right? Though very appealing, this is not true. And the reason is because this suggests that the pressure, saturating pressure is rho g lambda. And so if you use this in calculating the flow rate, you will have dependence in terms of lambda, right? which in term depends on the diameter of the container. Whereas in reality, if you measure this flow rate, it turns out to be fairly independent of the diameter. It doesn't depend on the diameter of the container. And that's a separate piece altogether. I don't think we'll have time to do that today. But essentially, if you have container of two different diameters, the flow rate depends on the diameter through which is, which is of the opening, not of the container. But this thing suggests that the pressure depends on the diameter of container. So this saturation of, saturation of pressure is reasonably explained, but it doesn't really, this is not what leads to the flow rate consistency. It turns out that if you do either detailed simulations or careful experiments in which you can look into inside, what happens is wherever the flow is occurring, around that region you basically get a zone where you have more or less fluid-like flow. So essentially you, let's say if there is an opening here, okay, this probably, so if I have a container and if I have an opening here, I get a small in which the fluid is flowing as if it's not facing any resistance. So above this, you essentially have more or less like solid-like 
things static, nothing much happening there, very slow motion, slow flow regime. And around this, it's as if the particle is freely flowing, uh, falling under gravity. And if you just, so for example, this, whatever we did here, if you do dimension analysis, the flow rate has to be proportional to So their flow rate has to be proportional to density, obviously. What else? Density is to volume flow rate, which is velocity into area, right? So you should have some velocity at the exit, average velocity into area of the exit, right? All right. Now this area is goes as d square. I'm again writing it in of so you'll have rho d square and then this v exit, if you assume that there's a sort of free fall arc and this free fall arc zone doesn't care how far your walls are, it just occurs close to the orifice. So within this zone, so your typical velocity scale for a particle which is falling this height will be, what is the typical velocity scale that you get if your particle is falling through a height? So if this diameter is d, this will be? d by 2, right? So what is the velocity your particle will gain if you fall through a height of d by 2? Root 2 g h, h being d by 2. So you'll have, and it turns out that this rho g raised to power half, d raised to power 5 by 2, and d here is the, well I should use capital D maybe, because This seems to describe the flow rate pretty well across various geometries. And in fact, this proportional constant is also not very different. It ranges from 0.55 to 0.65, no matter what type of particle you choose. So Beverloo did this long back, and it turns out that the flow rate is independent of the container diameter. It just depends on the exit diameter and the hypothesis, the recent Simulations demonstrate that this primary leaking because you have a free fall arc. In fact, you can simply go ahead and assume that at any height z, so if you have particles, you assume a free fall arc, the particle here has a different velocity, the particle from here has a different velocity. You can calculate that, that integral is very easy to calculate and this constant turns out to be pi over 5. So if you just do that, your constant C theoretical, if I say, is around pi by 5, and the C experimental that people have found, rather Beverloo has found, is typically within this range, and this number is I think 0.628 if I'm not wrong. So it seems to be reasonably well describing. So if I have to summarize this again. You do see pressure saturation in the bin. Materials do flow like liquids. But the flow rate independence because of height comes not because of pressure saturation, but because of a fluid-like zone around the exit and rest of the all material behaves like solid. So you have solid-like behavior and liquid-like behavior both occurring together. In fact, when you are falling from here, you are just assuming that there is absolutely no fluid. There is just free fall of particles. <coughs> so this solid-like, liquid-like, Behave com combined behavior and many situations you get gas like behavior. They basically sort of you know span this beautiful area called granular mechanics. I couldn't do much of the, do we have some time? I think we are done. Which I, so we had, I think I traversed into trajectories where I didn't want to go, but then we started and sort of, but there are many interesting phenomena that these particles show. And let me just show you some video because, can we? I'll just show you a couple of videos and so here is something, so I start with a mixture of grains, different sizes. The mixture basically just rotates in a tumbling. You have two different sizes of powders, two different types of particles in this particular case. And the flow continues, these are simulations but you observe in experiments and then you try to understand this using simulations because experiments, it is hard to probe inside them what is happening, you can only see at the surface. And did you notice something happening? Did you notice something happening? 
we started the reasonably well mixed condition and now they have sort of segregated. You have coarse particles on the periphery and fine particles in the grain. This is a sort of you know nightmare for pharmaceutical industry or for that matter many industry which basically deal with powder mixing. You want to mix powders and then make a tablet. Paracetamol, the fever reducing content is called estafiramin. If you don't mix the two, so let's say now I started with this, I thought that I'll mix them this way, okay. <coughs> you rotate them because you cannot put a stir and a stir it. You said, okay, I'll rather rotate the tumbler itself so that I mix. This is one of the common. And you do it this way. Now if you're taking the sample here, you don't have the fever reducing component. Or worse still, you take it from here, you have an overdose of that and you'll be sued. And companies like, you know, Qualitest and there are many other companies, they have called lots and lots of their, you know, material delivered to the industry, called by, delivered to the market, called back simply because of this goof of mixing. And there are many such interesting phenomena. So this is when you say, and no, so explaining this in terms of, for example, you know, simple how do different fluids and all becomes a bit messy. So there are different approaches. Similarly, let's say if I'm pouring something, okay, I don't know if this is visible. So now we are doing the same experiment except the cylinder is long enough. So we had a very small cylinder there. Now the cylinder is much bigger. All right. We are just rotating the cylinder starting from a well mixed condition. And maybe I'll just increase the time so that we save some time. You see bands, though it's, you have blue and red bands. So the material separates in different bands. So mixing these powders, particulate solids and powders <coughs> remains a nightmare. You know, how do you, you can make physical interventions and all, but physically what leads to this kind of formation? You have particles here differ in two different, they are of two different sizes. You get similar things if you do other stuff. So there are many interesting things that these materials show and I have been, not been able to cover many of them. There is just one more thing I will probably just show and stop here. So if you look at, for example, the landslides and these avalanches that happen, they are also essentially granular in nature. You have this collection of solid particles. Now this fellow created an avalanche and <laughs> gets caught into this, right? So essentially the material near the free surface, right? It's basically very unstable and you end up, so I'm so tempted to stop here, but I'll now see those people also caught. And they're dead, right? Well, they're not dead. Wait for a while, they'll come out of the plume. So you, what you see is this, the plume of the snow, which is the so you know, basically because of the air and it basically come as a, become as a cloud. People, you'll, you can see people coming out there. Let's just wait so that some of you don't feel sad that I killed people. Can you see them coming? Okay, right? So these, so the fundamental physics, how, how does these avalanches trigger so you near the surface and see this you don't have to go anywhere. You just, if you look at just this here, if I tilt this a bit, you get an avalanche. If I tilt this a bit, you get an avalanche. You tilt this. So this avalanche at the free surface, rest of the thing is behaving like solid. Just near the free surface, you get an instability and things start flowing, right? You get an avalanche. So there are various interesting behaviors that these materials show and we'll probably not go into all of those details. And remember in all this, we have not really included the complication of having the fluid along with. In a real life scenario, you have fluid complicating matter, right? So you basically have a ice with, you know, with water and also everything is basically being taken together. So with this, I'll probably stop here. I wanted to show you some of these demos of segregation, but I think those videos are, will have to suffice with those videos. <coughs> but this you can try at home. You take two mixtures, right? And you just shake it. And what you'll see is the long, big size particles will come to the top. You must, in fact, you open a coffee can back home and you'll always see the bigger particles on the surface. So these materials are ubiquitous. You find them everywhere. How do they behave? It's, it's you know, so common to observe, but how do they, you know, what is the fundamental physics behind this? It's very fascinating, very interesting. You don't have necessarily to belong to physics to deal with this. I do chemical engineering with these things because they are used everywhere. Uh, one more thing I wanted to show you. So in most of the stuff that we do, 
just to sort of you know give you the flavor of complications what we do in so this is where physics and engineering differ and that's why when you model experiments you treat this as a particle all right these are your steel balls you do experiments with them you have many of these you know you can do all the fun in real life however they are like this and they don't do such fascinating behavior all right in real life they come in all complex shapes i don't know if you, some of you can see it maybe you can pass it and this is way complicated than the simple sphere and the point is how do these hundreds of these spheres behave is what we are still trying to sort of you know very keenly understand how do these guys behave which is what people use in industry is a far cry that is what i'm my research area is that's why we try to sort of you know do something and maybe able to come up with something so with this i'll probably stop here and if you guys are interested for any other thing feel free to chat my email id is anuragt at itk feel free to drop by if you have any queries in fact just because so i do have a uh, i'm working with tata steel on a project which basically deals with you know, dealing with real particles as opposed to the theoretical particles which is spheres and what happens you know how do these particles mix and mix pack and pack that is what so if you any of you are interested in any kind of you know internship project anything feel free to write to me i'll be more than happy to help